I want to begin by quoting something from Jerome Bruner's uh, famous book, The Process of Education. This is a, a soft cover edition that I found lying in my library. This was published in the 1960s, so I don't know if that you'd have a copy on your own libraries. But this was a very influential document when I was beginning my graduate studies. You can see that's about 50 years ago, 1960, quite a while ago. But what Bruner, one of the things that Bruner said, and as you know, Bruner is still a professor here at uh, NYU, uh, although he's, he'll be uh, 98 this fall, so in, in a few days, actually. But anyway, what he pointed out was that when he came to try to address questions of education as a psychologist rather than exactly as an educational psychologist, he acknowledged the work that educational theory had done, but pointed out that he wanted to encourage a new kind of thinking, a new approach to the area. Here's what he wrote. For their part, educational psychologists turned their attention with great effect to the study of aptitude and achievement, and to social and motivational aspects of education. And, and we still are concerned with those things, ability, motivation. We, we say the effects of schooling are determined by the ability of the children and their motivation, their willingness to learn, as we say sometimes. But, he said, but it did not concern itself sufficiently with the intellectual structure of classroom activities. In other words, the question was not just what can you teach the kids, but what are they thinking? And Bruner was not the only one to ask that question, but he was certainly the one in, in psychology and in psychology of education to redirect the question from what can we do to the kids to what what are they doing? What are they thinking? I, uh, as a graduate student of, of Bruner's, I remember repeatedly asking and being asked, but what are they doing when a child was making an error in a task? It wasn't just to say he got it wrong or he should work harder. It was to say, what in the world was he or she thinking that would have led them to do that? Always the question about what is going on in the learner's mind? So you are interested in teaching and in, in, in affecting the behavior of children, absolutely. But you also want to know if you can address that question from a cognitive perspective. What are they thinking? What do they believe? Do they trust me? Do they believe this is serious? Do they think that this is a real obligation or do they think it's just kind of a wish? Uh, one of the things that we studied in those days was the difference between children's understanding of a wish and a uh, goal. It's very, you know, even for adults it's a bit fuzzy, but for children there's very little difference between a wish and, and a, an absolute goal. They have to sort out that difference. The difference being, just and I'm not going to elaborate on this, but the difference is that with the goal, you have to have a plan to get there. With a wish, you, you'd like to get there, but you have no plan. Now, once a child articulates in their own minds this distinction, they're already on the step to taking some responsibility for their own future, for their own actions, as Cynthia was uh, pointing out. Anyway, what 50 years of psych educational psychological research sponsored by this, this orientation led to was a great deal, and it continues to be, a great deal of interest in the intellectual processes of children. What I'm going to address is the fact that with all this interest in cognition, there has been the equivalent attention to moral behavior, to responsibility to accepting responsibility for oneself. And what I want to try to do today is to convince you that judgments like self-responsibility or responsibility for myself, moral obligations in general, are just as cognitive as the mathematical and spatial and other thinking problems that we discussed as cognitivists. So I want to say that the idea of self-control is a cognitive problem. It isn't a willpower problem or a determination or a resolution or a, 
um, a, is something like willpower. It's not a it's kind of a power that you have. It's knowing how to do something. And I want to try to spell out how that could be. But that's the general direction that I want to take the argument today, to put a cognitive, rational perspective on the issue of behavior and self-control. And, and that, what that means really is taking responsibility for oneself. Responsibility isn't a word that shows up everywhere in educational discourse. It does in practice. You know, teachers try to hold kids accountable, as we say. But a theory of responsibility, just what it is, who has it? How do you adjudicate it? That's remained rather fuzzy, and I, it deserves more attention. Now, the, um, the, the problem of self-control, responsibility, behavior management, um, and, and in general, who's responsible? Yes, maybe you can take that to that side, and you can take one this past you going here. Uh, the problem shows up in many domains. Um, the main one is in behavior management. Like we say, young children who 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 uh, behave badly lack self-control, and for young for parents, a major issue in their development of their children is teaching their children to control their anger and to uh, not throw temper tantrums and those sorts of things. In school, I, I gather your new school is known for issues of behavioral management. In school, it, it is an issue that, that a teacher either has to have control or find some way to, to manage the behavior of students in the school so that they're sufficiently orderly that you can actually do something. And so there's no fighting and all of those sorts of things. So behavioral management and self-control is the most conspicuous domain in which this topic is raised. Everybody's concerned about that. And of course, the, the books devoted to the topic would make a rather massive pile. There are many very good suggestions about how you cope with it. They tend to boil down to two to things, namely, don't give orders unless there's a reasonable chance of them being fulfilled. And don't give orders unless it's clear that you can show a child how he, what he needs to know in order to meet that, to, feel, to fulfill that. In other words, it's not just giving commands, it's seeing to it that the child has the knowledge and resources to know what to do in order to cope with that. And that's not always easily done. And the third thing is to make sure it has consequences. I mean, if you say, sit down, you have to, you have to really mean it and see that that has consequences, that violation of norms has consequences. But that's only an issue of control. That's not an issue of self-control. Self-control somehow emerges from that, but you need a theory to explain how controlling children turns into something like self-control. That's not well understood or explained uh, in my judgment. I'm tr I'll try to say something about that. The, uh, the, um, the second place that this is an uh, issue, so when is in behavioral management? The second area is moral development. Everyone is con concerned with higher levels of moral development, like concern for a fellow man, or in a simple case, fair play. What's fair play? I remember playing a game with two of my grandchildren, one who was quite socially mature and one rather socially immature. And so I said, that there was, I think I was playing catch with them, and I said, you have to take turns. And the, the one who was less socially mature, every time he would say, it's my turn, my turn. <laughs> so he obviously didn't get it. He, the, the other child, who was a little more savvy, realized, you know, what comes around goes around. So she was willing to take turns. But the other one, knowing the idea of my turn, commanded re receipt of the pitch, insisted that it was my turn every turn. Well. That's just the first step of moral development, but notions of justice, fairness, understanding the consequences for another person, understanding issues from another point of view, that's the whole topic of moral development. And 
all I want to say about moral development at this point is to say that that's an aspect of cognitive development in that to be moral, now I'll try to elaborate on this, is to have reasons for being moral. And the reasons are sufficiently good that one feels obliged. There's another word people don't like, but it's absolutely decisive. Feel obliged to live up to it. An obligation. People don't like to be obliged, you know, put yourself under an obligation. But that's, you do it every time you speak or act with another person. You're, to have any sort of reciprocal arrangement with another person is, is to bind yourself socially to that other person. Not to be harsh or cruel or dismissive or any of those, those things. Uh, um, uh, Cynthia refers to this as the Gricean cooperative principle. You know, in a conversation, you have to be cooperative. That's fundamental. If you don't cooperate, no conversation. Which is to say, you have to take the other person into account. So this is the, the second domain: is moral development. And the third development, I want to say, it's tied to general educational policy. And this may be heretical here in the U.S. Uh, it shows up, I believe, in the policy of No Child Left Behind, which I find objectionable in, in some kinds of ways. Objectionable in that it has no clear conception of who's responsible for what. All it's No Child says, Left Behind and it attaches money to it is if you'll improve the score, you'll be rewarded with more funds. And foundations are happy to pour in. You can show a high score, foundations pour in money, the government pours in more money, and so on. So there, there's kind of a basic rule here. Achievement gets the money. Achievement counts, it gets the money. But there's no th account of notions of responsibility. Whose responsibilities are this? The money goes straight to a, a system that's in control of the teachers, and the teachers are blamed if the students' scores don't come up. Well, that's just silly, because there are responsibilities all the way up the line. The fundamental responsibility for learning is the learners. That's a hard pill to swallow if you're an educator, because as an educator, you really feel morally obligated to, for the child's learning, as, as you should, because you have ob uh, obligations as a teacher, too. But the, the learning has to be done by the learner, by the child. It's the child's responsibility to do the learning. The teacher's responsibility is to see it to it that the child can take on that responsibility and manage their action. Managing learning is no different than any other kind of action. Namely, it's something you care out, carry out, the consequences of which you're responsible for. You know, if I, if, I, if I pour water on the floor, I'm responsible to clean it up and so on. So action, including learning, is something you are responsible for. And the, this, is, this is sufficiently understood in some contexts, and I'll try to elaborate on them, but it is completely undeveloped in No Child Left Behind. And, and so I find it oppressive simply to have legislation that ties funding to measurable outcomes on students without sorting out whose responsibilities and where should the rewards go. Um, for example, why, why is the money paid directly to the learners? You know, if, if you're willing to put $50 billion into the pot to make children learn to read, give them the money. You know, why put it all through those higher levels of bureaucracy? Filter it down to the agents. Anyway, the reason I gave you the handout, I'll keep a copy here is to show you that not only is my concern about No Child Left Behind theoretical, it's evidential. This is the second graph with all the blue, red, and green lines on. These are the PISA scores. Uh, you know, the international comparisons of children's performance in math and sciences. Uh, across, I believe it's the sixth grade, in the, all the children in the world, from the year 2000 to 2012. 2000 was the year No Child Left Behind was uh, innovated. 
these, these declining scores, you probably know that in the U.S. those scores have declined systematically. Um, in math particularly, that's the blue line. And in reading, that's the red line. What you may not have known is that you've taken a bunch of other countries with you, your, your initiative, including my own, Canada. That graph maps onto our can Canadian scores too, and to all the other countries that have adopted that policy. Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, Sweden, and the US. All of them who adopted this aggressive stance to say money goes to the people and the schools who deliver the, the results show this, exactly the same patterns. And it begins when No Child Left Behind comes in and it's continuing to this day. I, I think it's a failed policy and I don't understand why educationalists don't raise objections. Uh, I can tell you why they don't raise objections because there is a good aspect to the policy, namely a, a, accountability matters. I mean, that's so obvious. And they think that to make accountability matter, what you do is what they're doing. But of course, accountability matters at all the levels, and particularly at the level of the learner. That's where accountability matters. And because the policy doesn't address that, I think it's uh, a failed policy. Anyway, that's, I'll, I'll come around at, uh, maybe to that again at, at the end. Uh, so those are three domains in which issues of responsibility, who's responsible? And where does responsibility come from? How does a sense of responsibility arise? If you want to put it in popular jargon, you could say, where does self-control and willpower come from? But I would prefer you don't use that vernacular language. I think willpower just is to lose the game before you start. Because willpower doesn't make clear that the reason a person has willpower is because he knows what to do. And, the, and he knows the consequences, he or she knows the consequences of the action. It isn't just sort of uh, sheer grit. Although uh, a woman named Angela Duckworth is uh, trying to at least distinguish between you know, determination, which is usually called egocentrism. You know, if you're, if you're just looking out for yourself with relentless enthusiasm, that's egocentrism. That's, you know, soci sociopathy. So this sort of willpower, that this sort of drive is not the right way to take this. The other way to say that is that, as I quoted from Bruner here, it's a, at the beginning of science, you do want concepts that capture the big differences amongst people. Like IQ was a good idea in 1920. Because th there really was something about performance that those tests captured and that you wanted to encourage and at least see so you didn't harm. But what had happened in the last 50 years, of course, is that cognitivists showed that every time there's an intelligent act, it's because somebody knew something. They knew how to do this. They had a piece of knowledge that they could bring to bear on a task. It isn't just spatial ability, for example, or numerical ability. It's that you actually know the routine for, for numbers, like what happens when you add one. Knowing that kind of knowledge, you can generally call it mathematical ability. That's harmless enough, because you do want some general description. But if you want an account of what that is, you have to know what are the routines they know. What are the concepts and rules linking them that allow them to do this? So that, that's what cognitive uh, developmental psychology really has been trying to do for the last 40 or so years, is say, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? What are the reasons for doing it? Uh, OK, and I said that I now want to try to apply that approach to the whole issue of self-control moral responsibility, obligation, duty. 
in my green, so-called green book called the Psychological Theory and Education Development, I resurrected the notion of duty. You know, I think it's still, um, um, Treasure Island where the, uh, isn't it Treasure Island where the captain with one leg, <laughs> Long John Silver, I guess it says, when asked why, he's, why he did this and that, and he says, duty is duty. Uh, and I think that that's a very good reason to do things, a very good reason. You have an obligation and a duty. Now you can ask the question, why do you have that obligation and what obligations do you have? And are they worthy obligations? All of those questions need to be asked. But uh, the analysis of self-control has to get into issues like obligation and duty, and they have to be analyzed out in terms of beliefs and knowledge. What does a person know, need to know, in order that they could bring something under, take an o on an obligation for handling it? So it's no good to just say you need self-control. You have to take the situation where self-control seems missing and say, what would one need to know in order to not be uh, guilty of displaying things that people say la call a lack of self-control? How do you manage in a situation like that? Uh, Joseph Heath wrote a very nice book called Following the Rules. He's a philosopher uh, and he's interested in judgment, um, making judgments, mostly in rather esoteric domains, including uh, rational choice theory and, and, and modeling of human behavior and so on. Um, but makes a very good analysis of what it means to follow a rule. What self-control, I would say, should be interpreted of, what a lack of self-control is a breakdown of the rule. But of course, the ch children might not know the rule. That's one thing. And secondly, even if they don't know the rule, like don't lie or something, they might not know what are the possible options of coping with the dilemmas that led me to tell a lie in the first place. You see, you have to know, you have to know how to implement the rules. It's not enough just to know the rule. Okay. So what's common then to our set of problems? Well, the first issue is that of agency. Behaviorism threw agency out of the window. You knew that. The writers of No Child Left Behind are pure behaviorists. They say, this is the outcome and this is the consequence. Uh, they don't worry about agency and hence they don't really about worry about responsibility. They're simply looking at uh, outcomes and consequences. Well, in the history of psychology, agency disappeared with the behaviorists because the behaviorists said, the, Behavior of an animal is simply under the control of the stimulus. And it's quite true. The red light comes up and the pigeon pecks the spot and so on. Uh, conditioning theory. So behaviorism wanted to look at behavior and the stimuli or occasions that prompted it. It, were, it was the pragmatists. This was Charles Sanders' person. Every educator knows John Dewey, and you sh should read some John Dewey. No educator should be allowed to graduate without having read some Dewey. Uh, the Child in the Curriculum is a small book, uh, which is very readable, quick read, but you, you get the idea of what he's talking about from that. But you read a lot of Dewey, it's all very good. It was the pragmatists who, who borrow, borrowed from, from some German philosophers to some extent, but pragmatism was really a strong American movement. Uh, as you probably know, there was a wonderful book called The Metaphysical Club uh, about this group of philosophers, uh, William James, Charles Sanders Peirce, who is a sort of a father, and John Dewey, and a couple of others, and they used to meet at, 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 a, at a little room at, at Harvard, and they, have, they violently disapproved of metaphysics, you know, any grand eloquent theories about the soul or about meaning of life or anything like this. 
So ironically, they called themselves the Metaphysical Club. Um, and, and there's a book by that name, which is a, written for general readership. It's a very interesting book. Anyway, it was the pragmatist philosophers, this American movement, that made agency the beginning of the psychology. What's, what are they doing? In other words, instead of saying, why does the word table refer to a table, they said, why does anybody call that thing a table? Why did they, why did they do that? And the reason they do that is because they want somebody else to pay attention to it, say something like that. And, and it's an action of trying to communicate that uh, makes language play such a fundamental role. So they moved away from control, simple control by the stimulus that the behaviors had, to the action of an agent. This was pragmatism. And Dewey, as a pragmatist, continues to be very influ influential. We still talk about learning by doing, and we want to have classrooms more experimental, and we want to have uh, children carry out more activities rather than just be lectured to and all of those sort of things. Learning by doing has been a catchword in education for about 300 years. Comenius, Comenius who published the first book on, for learners, central claim was you learn by doing and he wanted the children to have a workbook so they could actually do something rather than just be exposed and taught things. And Dewey certainly built on that learning by doing. Um, but they went further to say that it, it's not just that you do it, it's that you know that you're doing it. It's sort of planful doing that Dewey was interested in. You see when you're doing, often off you do things like I'm shuffling across the floor here but I'm not I'm doing that, but I'm not deliberately doing it or anything. Um, so what counts in action is what you're intentionally doing, which is to say something like what you have as a plan or a goal or with some uh, activity or goal in mind. So that's what the doing is. Well, agency is at the key, at, at the base of responsibility. That's sort of by definition. You know, if, you, if you're the one who did it, you're the one who's responsible. If, if you did it by, but under somebody else's power, then you're not responsible. Like if somebody knocked me and I knocked the water on the, walk, knocked a bottle of water onto the floor, well, I'd, I'm not responsible in the same way as if I had knocked the bottle. And if I do it accidentally, it's not, I'm not responsible in the same way as if I did it deliberately or planfully. This is, this is ordinary language. Mind you, children don't know this ordinary language. Six and seven, five and six and seven year olds, they just have to work out these categories. Piaget started the, these studies, but they've been done uh, with enormous finesse over the last 40 or 50 years of children recognizing when they're, res when they're responsible because they did it, or they, as opposed to when they did it accidentally, or when they did it as a result of somebody else's control, or they did it because they were carrying out an order. So children have to learn that language. That language is really a part of learning moral development, but it's also part of the language for learning self-control because they have to then come to realize, well, which things am I really responsible for? You know, this, I did it deliberately, I'm much more responsible than if it, it was inadvertent, and so on. So agency is at the base of the whole notion of responsibility. No, if you're not the agent, you're not responsible. And agency is necessary for learning. Animal learning studies show that if the animal realizes that something they did produced the response, they learn it like this. Because the a being agency and knowing the consequences of one action is, is the basic mechanism for learning, knowing what the consequences of one's actions. This is what behaviorism captures very well, animal training studies and, and so on. So that is fundamental. 
but it's only part of the story because um, agency is common to all creatures that can learn. But when we want to talk about human responsibilities, we want some further description of what would be involved beyond simply the ability to learn that would explain something like responsibility for the self. And that dimension is the social dimension. So it's not just agency. It's agency in relation to others. And there's a lot of work on the social psychology. Cynthia was sending me some references. Uh, um, to Ma Michael Tomasello has written a nice book on how fundamental social engagement is to higher forms of learning. The thing that di distinguishes the apes that he compares to humans is the human capacity for social engagement. Other animals will engage with people, but humans have kind of a relentless drive for, uh, and ability to in integrate with others. Um, this, is, this goes back a long ways too. It was attach, attachment theory developed in the 1940s. Bowlby sh showing babies are attached to their parents, not only physically, but psychologically. And the, the amount of distance between the infant and the mother increases with time. But that bond, so social bond, is the glue that holds everything together. Now, getting back to responsibility. So what we need for a theory of responsibility is not just agency, but agency linked to social engagement. And, and that, it's that link that I think allows one to move from just knowing the consequences of one's action to being responsible for one's action, because responsible now changes from just knowing what happens to responsibility to others. Now that is deep, deeply in human nature too. Uh, that philosopher I mentioned, Robert Brandom, uh, and this is one of his books, not his best, but, uh, and not his latest, but, but he's very good. Uh, at uh, articulating the fact that many that social practices with humans with infants are social, but there's a peculiar change that occurs when you learn language, and that and that change is that when you learn to say something. You're not just learning that this is called a table. As a matter of fact, naming is the smallest part of language. What you are learning to do is to contract with other people. So when I say this is a table, if I say it to you, I'm putting myself under an obligation to you that I'm telling you the truth about this table. Actually, he got the idea from Peirce. Brandom got the idea from Charles Sanders Peirce, the pragmatist I mentioned earlier. Because Peirce was the, the first to say, when you make an assertion, you are putting yourself under an obligation. You're taking responsibility for the belief you engender in the listener. And if you make an assertion, like if I say this is the table, I am putting myself under a, a variety of obligations. That namely, I, I know that. This is a table, that a table is a piece of furniture, that it's a piece of furniture that's used normally for eating or writing on, and a whole bunch of obligations that I'm committing myself to just by saying something, even by saying a single word. Like when a child's first word is usually mummy, I'm, I'm sure children obviously don't have any theory about what, what all they're taking on. But what they are doing when they learn the first word is that they're making a contract with another person. Just assertions, just saying things. Now, in my own work, I've studied promising. And in, when you make a promise, it's, it's clear you're making an obligation to another person. You know, if I say I'll promise to be there at 12, the other person is supposed to be able to rely on your word. 
and organize their behavior, their behavior on the basis of something that you've promised. So that that's too is a social obligation. So these, this n network of social responsibilities then, it may be deep in our species, but it's, it's worked out in a theory of language. In learning a language, you are elaborating your set of obligations to other members of the society. And the language is learned by learning those con conventions of what a people can assume when you tell them something. So if you, if you, if you call this thing a chair, you know, they, they will correct you, the community will correct you and say, no, it's not a, that's not a chair. Or if you say it and mislead somebody into confusing them, then you're responsible for, uh, the, for the resulting confusion. So you see, learning a language is an enormously social process. That's what the pragmatists insisted on. And it's social in the sense that you're contracting obligations to other people. Okay, now, so these are rules. Learning the language is learning a bunch of rules for saying things to other people that other people can believe, rely on, and act on, and, and so on. And in the process of learning those rules, you're putting yourself under an obligation to follow those rules. So here we have lots of duty and obligation just by learning to talk. Because when you're learning to talk, you're learning the rules of the game. If you violate the rules, people will uh, won't understand you or they'll discourage you from doing it, correct you or whatever. Um, and it, but in, on the other hand, in learning the rules, you're learning a whole set of possibilities of social action and interaction that you wouldn't have if you didn't know the language. So this is the historical dimension of uh, uh, self-control and responsibility as well, in that control has to be distinguished from self-control. Because if you're only under obligation in learning the rules of language, I mean, that seems like it's an enormously constraining force. You're, uh, you're learning the rules, but the rules are controlling you. There isn't any room for individual freedom. And this was the theme that, of course, was played out in Rousseau and, and the uh, 18th century um, in, 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 and by the in, in so-called Enlightenment, when Rousseau, Rousseau began his book, The Social Contract, by saying, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. Because the social rules at that time were felt to be so oppressive. Uh, and of course, they were rules mostly of monarchy and the church. The, the, the state power was in the hands of the monarch who could tell everybody what to do, and your, your emotional, psychological, and social life was under the control of the church who told you what you could do and think and so on. So those were the chains. And the idea was you had to break away from those chains if you were ever to have anything like freedom. And I found a quotation from John Keats, the, the um, poet, who said, in one of his poems, he said, open wide the mind's cage door. Open wide the mind's cage door. Do you get it? The mind is like a cage. And you open, the, open it wide and let, let, li let life thrive. Well, rules can be oppressive. And that's probably how they're experienced by uh, children to a large extent because they don't have, they don't understand why such some rules exist. Nor can you give a full explanation of why these rules exist. Like, why should you have to go to bed at eight? I mean, how arbitrary is that? Well, don't tell the kid it's arbitrary. It's just say that's, that's the rule. And there are consequences, not, not horrendous, hopefully, but the rules are rules and they are binding in some, in some sort of way. Anyway, the counter-argument to that, and even, even Rousseau uh, mentions this, in that if the rules are taken by yourself as an agreement, they're not oppressive. 
they may be rules that you allow you to play a game. Like if you agree to accept the rules of chess, you can play chess. So those rules aren't oppressive because you agreed to them. You took them on, you saw they were legitimate and valid. You're willing to defend them and you're willing to live with the constraints it puts on action because it permits certain other kinds of action. So now I'm saying to get self-control, the rules have to be seen as your own rules. So this is my theory of self-control. It doesn't amount to very much, but it's this. That self-control is really the same thing as social control, except that the rules now are explicit. Oh, this is the rule about if I go to bed at 8, I can be entitled to this or that or something. Uh, and agreed upon. And they're agreed upon because the learner thinks, yeah, that's a good idea. Now, this applies both to knowledge and to, to moral judgments. Namely, that in both domains, behavior is to be explained in terms of sets of rules. At 4 o'clock you do this, at 6 o'clock you do that. This is how you read a book, this is how you do that. These are all procedures which can be described as rules. You, the progress in moral and intellectual development is making the rule explicit. Now what that means is that you not only know that this is how it's done, but you, you, can, are, you can put into words, this is the rule. Here's how we do it. This is how it's done. And secondly, you, ha you learn procedures for saying, that's a good rule. You can make a judgment about a belief, say, if you're doing science. The rule there is, let's say, a relationship between uh, pressure and volume or something like pressure and temperature, whatever the rules are. And then you can get evidence. You learn how to evaluate the rules. Is that a good rule? Yes, because the evidence uh, corresponds to it. There's no counter evidence. You know, all the things for judging whether an idea is a good idea, evidential based. And the same in moral judgments. How do you judge that it's a good rule? Well, if that rule held, that this would be the implications. This is the reason for holding the rule. Here's how you judge a good moral rule. It's a generally applicable. This was Kant, for example. If it's a good rule, you wouldn't mind it seeing be implemented worldwide, not just for me. Uh, so those are ways of judging that the rule, bringing reason to bear on the rules. So here's the theory of self-control. Self-control is procedures almost always of social origin, contracted with other people, that can be made explicit. You can give a verb, you can put it into words, and you can justify the rule by reasons. And evidence is one kind of reason in the, in the sciences, evidence is one of the most important kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. But in other domains, yeah. logic bears, yes? Could you repeat the definition of it? Of what moral, of yeah. self-control? Yes, yeah. yeah. self-control is acting in terms of rules which are explicit. You can formulate them as a statement or a rule in words or in equations or whatever and justify the rule by a set of reasons. You can say, that's, that's a good, here are good reasons for adopting this rule. Now, sometimes children won't accept the reason and they want to flout the rule, and you have to use a, something beyond reason, like consequences, to uphold the rule, if it's of, of a general importance to the larger social group. But the aspiration always is, and if the, if the goal is self-control, it's got to get to the point where the rule is known and honored, taken as an obligation by the performer as the way to do things. This is the, correct, this is the right way to do things. This is the good way uh, to do things for these reasons. And so you feel obliged to do, the, to do them. And if you break the rule, you feel shame. You know, I just read 
nothing better in my li library when I was leaving than uh, Freud's Civilization and Its Discontents. So I read it. It's mostly a book about shame, and shame results from the violation of a norm. That's not exactly the way he used it, because he took as fundamental the lib libido, the urges, as the main engine. What I'm, and what people like Brandom and other philosophers have done more recently is to say, it's a violation of a social rule. You break the rule, you know you've broken the rule, and that's what produces the shame. Okay, so that's the, really that's my uh, my whole theory. I'll just run over it again. All behavior is rule based. Even the pigeon in the Skinner box, pecking at that spot, it's a rule. He learns a rule. He can't put it into words. The experimenter can put it into words and, and write it as a as a description, but all behavior, quantifiers are a problem here, maybe I should not say all, <laughs> uh, because there are, there's more ways of cognizing than just propositions, as you know, there are graded uh, relations as well as categorical ones, but uh, ignoring that for the moment. More or less all behavior can be described in terms of a rule. What, and breaking the rule has consequences for the pigeon. You don't peck the spot, you don't get the food. The violation of the rule is universal basis for learning. Um, what people can do with language is they can make a rule explicit. They can put it into words, but putting it into words takes an ob makes an obligation to the listener. You can't have the words for nothing. The words are social practice. You want the words, you make a contract with the listener. So if you're going to talk, you're un putting yourself under an obligation to other people. And that's what makes you go from agency to um, Self-control is the move for social obligations. So now you have a rule that's public, it, you're socially obligated. What turns it into the third stage is that you now hold, you think, you not only know what the rule is and can express it, you can say that's a good rule or that's a rotten rule. The rule should be changed um, to make it more fair or more inclusive or, or whatever. So, so there's kind of a rational theory of what self-control is it, uh, uh, that I would offer as an alternative to willpower, notions of willpower or um, trait theories. Just say that you know some people have a lot of um, self-control and others don't. That's the other piece of data on that graph that I showed you. I should mention it because it's a lovely study. It's the first top left corner of the page. Just look at the graph on the upper left. You see it going down. There's all the scores go down. What that is, this is a study by Moffat. This, they studied an entire city in New Zealand. They got every child that was born in the year, I think, 2003, and followed these people for So it wasn't 2003. They followed them for, I think, for 30 years. So the babies that they studied in, must be 73 or something, they followed them right till now and, ga and gave measures of all sorts, including measures of self-control. And the self-control test is the so type, is that marshmallows test. You, you know, it's very famous. Uh, you see it on TV every week now. Um, Walter Michelle invented it. You say to a child, you put a marshmallow in front of the child and you say, you can have this marshmallow now or if you w wait till I come back, you can have two. And some children can't stand the pressure and they eat the marshmallow. 
uh, uh, most young children do. And in fact, all children do if the experimenter stays away more than about a half a minute or a minute. <laughs> they all give in eventually. But that's only one kind. Kong Lee, my c a colleague at University of Toronto, just tells them a rule. He says, he goes, the child's sitting in a chair facing this, and he goes behind the child and makes a squeaky toy <laughs> behind the child, and he says, don't turn around and look at that. Uh, and I, I have to go and answer the phone, but I'll be right back. But don't look at that. And of course, they just can't resist. The, the children are beautiful when they're, you know, age four to seven or so. They just can't stand it, and they turn around and have a look. And what he does is measure how long you could stand it. And this is kind of a measure of self-control. And if you do those kinds of measures and look at a variety of factors like school achievement, the amount of a adult earning, the incidence of drug abuse, the incidence of being in, bed in poverty, every social factor, the three big ones there, the higher your score on self-control, the less likely you are to have these problems. And this self-control manifests the beginnings of it in, in their four and five years old. So it's an amazing study. What? Who is the author? Okay. Moffitt. M O F F I T T. Moffitt and 12 other authors. This was a very big study, and it was published in the Proceedings of the uh, uh, National Academy of Education, I think. I have the reference, it's in the paper, but Moffitt. Anyway, so self control matters. And it shows up quite early. Now, th that, might, that leads people to think that some people have it and some people don't, which is, which there may be a little bit of truth to that. You know, everything has deep, deep basis, so we don't know about those things. But I would point out that these measures of self-control are all linguistic compliance. The ability to follow an order, to grasp an order, and to comply with it. So it isn't just grit that these tests measure. It's measuring, do they understand what the adults said? Did they understand the difference between one now and two later? Do they understand the, that the two later is preferable? And finally, if they would prefer the two, do they, can they think of some means that they can use to avoid eating the, the one? And kids do invent things. Some Try to look a different way. Look ahead. The videos of these things are quite dramatic, you know. They bite their teeth together and <coughs> grimace and do everything else to <coughs> avoid eating that one candy. The poor little kids. So self-control is important. What it is remains the theoretical question, and the theoretical question matters because if the theory that I've been talking about is correct, then we know what to do. Namely. Get kids to be explicit about what the rules are. So uh, when a child violates a rule, ask them, say, do you know what the rule is here? Do you see w what you're supposed to do? Now, the less you have to do that, the better. But if, the, if there is some possibility that they don't grasp the rule, get them to, s to say it. In, te in teaching, in uh, acquiring knowledge, if you tell a kid a mathematical truth, let's say that you know, uh, opposite uh, angles are equal or something like this. Get them to put it into words. Get them to say. Because they'll, they'll say, oh yeah. But if, you, if they have to say it back, then now it's their rule. They're the ones who've said it. And by saying, remember, you're, you are taking on an obligation when you say things. You're, ob you're saying this is... This is what I want you to believe when I say it. It's a social contract. Language is a social contract. So getting the kid to say it rather than just nod in agreement. And then the third thing, of course, is I was saying, get, teach them to re procedures for evaluating those rules. Is that a good rule? Does it hold in every case? Are there counterexamples? That this is uh, epistemological development. Are there counterexamples. Can you think of a negative case? Can you think of other positive cases? Can you think of what would happen if you generalized it to other domains? You know, all of these sorts of questions.
questions for judging the validity of knowledge. And the same for moral judgments. Would that be a good rule to hold uh, widely? So that's the, uh, the social origins of, of self-control. And then finally, to go back to No Child Left Behind, what needs to be done is the, the same sort of thing. So if, you want a, if you want a school, school improvement, you don't just put pressure on and rewards. You don't just use inducements and rewards. You sort it out in terms of what are the obligations? Who's willing to take them on? What do they see as the consequence of it? By putting pressure on the teachers, the child's supposed to suddenly think, oh, this is urgent that I start to do my homework because my teacher's not going to get full pay. Of course not. It's absolutely ridiculous. And unless you spell out what the obligations and their consequences are, policies like that are just mindless. Mindless. I couldn't believe that uh, Obama simply adopted that from Bush. I don't know what's going on with those guys. Instead of just telling a child, don't turn around and look at the behind to see what's there, he, all he does is say to half of the children, say it. The kid says, I won't. I won't. He's, the kid says, and he says, no, no, say it in, in words. I won't turn around, they say. They, they don't. That's, over, that's an exaggeration, but they're much less likely to turn around if, if they've made, the, made it clear what the rule is and they've expressed it, they've made a commitment to it, then they treat it as an obligation and they're less likely to look around. Astonishing, I thought. Okay, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Yes. I just want to make a comment about your, your, not this last thing you just mentioned, but the ridiculousness of the Penn DLD really played out last year when we had to do the, the millions measures of student learning. And the kids at our school, Young was the only one here with me, but I'm sure you guys experience this too, but our high school kids are like, we're not doing this. <laughs> like, this isn't for us. This doesn't give us any information. I mean, they were like, they, yeah, what's in it for me? Yeah, yeah. what? Yeah, how do it, it, it just, it, you know, you, how do you, it was just awesome to see yeah. our kids, they just already had it. Oh, yeah, so you kind of like had to beg them, like, the teacher's ratings, let's do it, <laughs> please do it, let's break something down, and we had like some, but hey. I mean, Interesting. You know, I had a colleague from Italy who, in the days when people were studying personality by these checklists, they still do it, of course, but heyday of this stuff was in the 1950s, you know, checklists that see how aggressive or impulsive or this and that you were. And so he decided to give this to Italian kids. And they sort of looked at him like this and then they, they just put X's all over the sheets. They weren't going to fool around with that no. stuff. This, you know, why should I do that? They would say. So they couldn't, they couldn't do personality tests with their kids. In. But I don't think people expected the kids to react like that. I don't, I don't think the policy makes Never crossed their mind, no. No. No, not at all. They, th they think, they do have a rule, the behaviorist rule, which is a, tr a basically true rule, that actions should have consequences. And the only way people know the significance of their actions is that they do have consequences. So that, that rule shouldn't be denied. So assessment is important and all of that. Very important. But... If, if behavior isn't just controlled by some payoff, but by what people can do, what they're willing to do, what they think they can do, what they think is in their interest to do, unless you address those things, those, the, the, that general framework doesn't Oh, Yeah, interesting. Oh. Um, I think that the speaking, and you would bring it up with the theorists, it made me think of Cynthia and her work around learning cultures and the work that we're doing in schools. Um, because when we're talking about responsibility, we have responsibility teams where kids, you know, they get together and they understand and they learn the different challenges and strengths of each other and they kind of have to say those things out loud and make these obligations to each other. Mm. And that, that, that never clicked to me until I heard um, what you just said. 
so the power of the responsibility teams that we have at our school, where it's just not me as a teacher saying, okay, I know all your data and it's trapped in my mind and I'm going to make all these moves for you, but what power it is to take a group of students or even adults and say, okay, each of us have, each of you, including myself, have a responsibility to let everyone know what your strengths and your challenges are and then work together because we're all obligated to do that. So I just thought that that was really powerful. I mean, I thought of all the learning culture formats. As you were speaking, I thought of unison reading and the power of once you make an assertion because that's one of the speech acts that's yeah. on the unison reading record and kids are at our school, the Unison School, kids are familiar with the different speech acts that they can make and the power behind them and what it calls you to action to do and others around you. And finally, the conference, when you were just talking, you were saying, um, when you're talking about school improvement and making sure students and I guess people in general understand obligations, who's going to take them on, and then spell out those obligations at the end of a student-led conference, um, when the student sets a goal to move forward in his or her work, the power of that is to, for me not to say, okay, your goal next time is to do this, but have the student actually say it out loud. So it was really awakening for me to hear the theorists, the connection between the theories, how Cynthia so, in my opinion, so brilliantly put it together and the movement and, the, and how it's empowering students in learning culture school. Good, good, interesting. Yes, sorry. So, um, you know, the theories you're talking about make sense to me in terms of self-control and even the critique of NCLB, but on the flip side, what would you recommend? Like, what would a policy look like that gives kids self-control over educational attainment in something like NCLB? So, for example, in New York City, they um, instituted some rules about students being held back at third or eighth grade if they didn't meet these sort of minimum standards, which didn't necessarily have much of an effect at all on student performance on these tests. So I'm struggling to think about what a policy would look like that actually gives students a sense of rules that lead to their own self-control and self-attainment. Yes. With negative side effects, right? Like right. Kind of like retention or high school exit. Right. Yes. You know, when they... There, there's a case in Canada that's analogous to this. One t teacher in a s high school um, was, I think, just tired of the fact that so many kids weren't turning in the assignments when they were due. And they'd procrastinate and so on, and sometimes not fill them in, and he'd have to take the average of the other three tests or whatever. So he instituted a policy, and he didn't negotiate this. He simply made it a rule. If the assignment's not in, you get a zero. Well, then all the ones who were negligent of turning them in, great fuss, brouhaha, complained to the school board, and then to the Minister of Education for the whole province. And now there's a big <laughs> hearing on whether he violated the child's human rights by giving them zeros for the score and all of this stuff. And, and the two sides flare right up. The one said, what kind of a prison are you running? And the other side saying, if you, if, you, if you can't learn to play by the rules, you can't play school, you know? So the latest indication is that the teacher who was, I believe, even suspended temporarily has been reinstated, uh, saying that he, he has, a, as, as a teacher, he has a right to hold students accountable for what they do. Now, the difficulty is, so, so accountability is important here. The difficulty comes when you use massive procedures of accountability, let's say closing of schools, rather dramatic. When I brought this article from the New Yorker on this 21st of August, did you read it called Wrong Answers? This is a beautiful article on the Atlanta school crisis. You really should read this because the, these are the teachers who cheated on their kids' scores. And the, the, the one who admitted he cheated said, they were going to close my school unless their scores went up, so I improved their... <laughs> and the superintendent was telling me, improve their scores or, you, or you're out of here. You know? So all these social pressures, it's, it's a marvelous piece of uh, journalistic writing. Anyway. 
getting back to your issue, what do you do beyond saying if you don't do your marks, you're going to fail? The, the uh, approach that I would think is more reasonable is limited outcomes and limited gains in limited context. In other words, obligations for smaller things. And I think this is sort of known in the practice too, like obligations for showing up at school on time aren't trivial matters. They're sort of the rules and they, they matter. You've got to learn the rules. And it's, it's a nuisance to the teacher to have to make a fuss about it, but it's, if there are rules for the room, they have to be monitored so that kids learn there are procedures for doing this and those procedures can be made explicit in the rule. And when they are, they're going to be held accountable. But I wouldn't hold a, a thing about holding back for the whole year. That's rather, that's rather dramatic. I would think that you would hold back for smaller things. Like if you didn't do that page of math, I don't know what can you do. Can you, keep, you can't even keep them in after school anymore because of the buses and all that sort of thing. But you do have some resources. I know teachers who say, if you didn't get that, you show up here at 8.30 tomorrow morning and I'll help you see that you get it, I'll see that you get it done. That sort of thing. You have other, you may have other resources that you can do to enforce smaller level commands. But that's not much of an answer. I know that's the ongoing challenge always to make them accountable and yet not put penalties that are so severe that they just quit, which is what they will do if, this, if the outcomes are dramatic. So I, I really like this idea of, because I think you're right, there's a lot of the work out of psychology is kind of suggesting self control is this thing you have or you don't, and people talk about grit and willpower as this. Um, and then you have Heckman, I don't know if you know, Heckman is calling it non-cognitive. You know, he talks about self-control as a non-cognitive skill, which, as you said, is very cognitive. Um, and that idea that it's responsible to other people, I think, makes a lot of sense. But I, I guess one thing I wrestle with is that the responsibility to other people and the rules or norms are very contingent on setting, right? And so, you know, I was thinking of a dance club, right? So one of the norms of the dance club is that your self-control means you're dancing. You're not allowed to stand in the middle of the floor and stand still. And you have to kind of dance to the rhythm. You're not allowed to dance like too wild. You're not allowed to dance at the wrong rhythm, right? That, so your self-control plays out really differently as opposed to classrooms, which are these really weird settings where you have to kind of sit in your, you know, traditional classrooms, you have to sort of sit in your chair most of the time. You have to raise your hand before you speak most of the time. And so I guess the, what I struggle with a little bit is, you know, you said playing school, like how much are we teaching children to kind of control themselves in these weird environments that we call classrooms uh, in ways that may not always be that helpful in the other environments they're gonna be in because at home and in a lot of workplaces, you're not supposed to wait to talk before you can raise your hand, right? And you're allowed to say things, you know, that might break the norms and disagree with some, you know, in a traditional classroom, you're not really allowed to disagree with the teacher very often, right? Mm -hmm. But if you never disagree with your boss, you're not a very good employee, right? Yeah. So, Yes, no, I think that's a very good question. And one of the criticisms of the kind of approach that I take here is, is a cultural one to say that the norms established in the school are just the imposition of a rather abstract European culture onto everybody else. We have a big issue in Canada with Aboriginal people who uh, are objecting to the imposition of Western modes of schooling, not generally, many are enthusiastic about adopting Western education, but others are saying, no, those are just, that's just your Western way of doing things, you know, have to be on time, turn it in, turn in the assignments on a particular date, show up for work at a certain, you know, all these rules and regulations, they're just your culture and you're imposing your culture on our culture. Uh, and there, I won't try to address that particular, except to say that school is um, is the primary instrument for learning how the larger how larger Western societies work. You know, um, you have to you have to register. You have to keep 
document you have to document everything in a school. Well, that's because the larger society documents it. You, if it says uh, age or gender or something on a form, you have to put in the correct figures, you know, and you have to, you have to keep providing this this stuff. They seem like they're arbitrary in school, but in fact they mirror the larger society to quite an extent. They don't always, and sometimes they should be should be some school procedure should be overthrown, but many of them are already steps toward seeing how the larger society works. So, th so that's why I worry about the passivity piece, right? About which? The passivity piece that in like yes. a lot of traditional classrooms, you can follow the rules by not engaging, right? Like you can sit mm -hmm. and opt out, and if the teacher asks you a direct question, you can answer with a one word, right? Um, not you know, some of the, the, the sort of settings Cynthia's worked on in lots of other settings where you're actually held accountable to do more active things than that. But in a, many traditional classrooms, including classrooms I'm in, you know, they're, that's kind of allowed. That doesn't break the norms very much. Yeah. Maybe a little bit, maybe you get a C. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not breaking the norms very much to be completely passive. Yes. But if you think about a lot of settings that adults are in, that's not just inappropriate, but sometimes bad, right? It's yeah. harmful. This is very tricky because some kids knowing you know they don't want to. They don't want to be a nerd, so they won't speak out, even if they could, because they they don't want to stand out as being weird in some sort of way. So they have a lot of this stuff in adolescence and so on. These are so interesting and so complicated. But um, about as far as I could take it in, in my own thinking is thinking that th that social life is based on rules, and as you say, there are different social norms for different domains. And as educators, we shouldn't be ashamed of the norms that are imposed in schools. They are pretty valid. You know, they, uh, they take in a broad range of children. They treat them extremely humanely. We have high hopes and aspirations for them. And to carry out these practices, we do have rules, like you have to show up at a certain time. You have to do your share of the work. You have to treat others in a certain kind of way. And, and those rules are pretty good. They work in. If it's a good school, they work for the school, and they do reflect larger social life. But uh, as you point out, they don't always, and they don't always work. And I, I don't know how to. So, no, yeah, th no, well, no, no, no. I think I want to like sort of extend Michael's scenario of passivity towards something a little bit sort of a more radical image of success um, with this kind of rules way of thinking. So, you know, you have a school that has all these rules that are arguably sort of Western and so on and so forth. And it's very successful, right? So the students all become extremely good rule followers. They graduate, they go out into society. We have a workforce full of these people who all follow all of the rules. Social change never happens. How do we deal with that as an issue? Yes. Um. Well, that's what uh, that's what Rousseau worried about. You know, he thought that they were we were just enslaved to a culture of of surveillance, which we now are again, <laughs> and of uh, control by uh, by outside authorities. And he called for a social revolution. You know, uh, eventually the French Revolution, which was more more than anybody asked for. Um, but. Um, Sometimes social change is caused by serious revision of rules, like get, giving people the vote, you know, things like that. So many social rules are up for negotiation. And I did, this does raise a really an interesting question, because when, if you do adopt a rule-based notion like I was talking about here, you have to also raise the question of how do you judge that it's a good rule? And if they do that, they're already being somewhat critical of the rules that are being implemented. You, 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 can, still <coughs> you can still impose a rule if people think it's not, not a great rule. Uh, you know, but it's a rule that we have here in our family or in our school or something like that. But allow them to say why it's not, it's not a good rule and maybe the next generation they'll change the rule. In, in other words, rule-based <coughs> theory doesn't, Certainly, certainly I, I wouldn't see it as excluding social change. It's true you induct children into a social order, 
But if you do it in, in the way of knowing what the rules are and knowing the reasons for holding the rules, sometimes the reasons say the rules should be changed, you know, if you're evaluating the rules. If you're just, that's the difference between control and self-control. Control, somebody else is exercising the rules. One, with self-control, they're your rules. And you're evaluating the rules. And, and you can work to change them because they are your rules. You can absolutely reject them for your own self if you want as well, of course, seeing they're your own rule. These are good, good questions. Yes? Could I, I don't want to be an apologist for No Child Left Behind, but I do want to, <laughs> I want to introduce some greater complexity into your argument. <clears throat> so, No Child Left Behind is, of course, the latest manifestation of ESEA, the idea that the federal government should give money to schools that were impacted by poverty. And, uh, right. and it was Robert F. Kennedy, Senator of New York, who said, but how will we know it makes a difference? How will we know that that's efficacious? Thus was born standardized testing yeah. massively yeah. across the country. Now in two, 2000, and 2000, I think, 2001, uh, George Bush, but not just George Bush, huge majority of Congress said, that's not good enough. We, because, because, the schools seem to be blaming it all on, on the poverty and not taking any responsibility for the outcomes of, of kids. And that's unacceptable. So yes, they introduced an absurdist, you know, crazy scheme that by 2014, 15, everybody's gonna be on standard. And it, and it collapsed of its own weight and Obama has now waived it all, basically, and introduced what arguably might be at least a glimmer, and yes, it was definitely behaviorist, but might be a glimmer of a more, uh, more generous idea about where the responsibility should be for improving these schools. And you can see it in this state. So a school that has persistently low, first of all, is poverty impact that has persistently low scores is in trouble. And as a result of the de declaration of trouble, it gets to decide. It's not declared a failure. It's not closed down. Now, it was under Bloomberg Klein, but the Blasio Farina say, no, 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 we don't want to close schools. We want to improve them. So they get to choose Cynthia. You know, a school can say, I want to work with this professor at NYU. She's got this idea. It's influenced by, you know, by uh, this guy named Olson from Canada and others. and uh, isn't that, I mean, isn't that a kind of good thing to be moving in that direction? Or yes, no? yes, that's very interesting. Um, uh, experimentation, innovation in, in school, if, if, it, if it helps do that, uh, I think it's wonderful. But I, I don't read the uh, implications of um, uh, no child left behind in the, in the same way. What, what I see happening is a, an increasingly uniform curriculum called core, core standards and increasingly narrow assessment devices that sees that everybody does that. And all that does is squeeze innovation out because then if that's the criterion that's going to be met and that's what pay schedules are going to be based on, People will sort of try to nudge the program so that it increases those specific things, but the system just becomes more oppressive rather than liberating. And I, I think uh, it doesn't have the effect that's desired. If it's, if it's an attempt to open up for experimentation and tr trying, um, I think it's a wonderful thing uh, because it, it, um, what were those experiments, uh, the so-called Hawthorne effect, you remember? Any experimental group's better than any control group, no matter what, you know, no matter what you do. Uh, because there's a certain kind of energy that's involved in an experimental group. You're trying out some ideas, and they're your ideas, and you have some commitment to them, so you, you work uh, better with that. So th those things are very good. But if it's just a matter of funneling children in to meet narrow criteria that judge by this precise 
measurement instrument, then I, then I worry for our, for our children. You know, schools should be learning self-control of your ideas. You know, judging your own ideas, learning that they're my, these are my ideas, these things I actually believe. It's quite interesting. Children learn all sorts of things in school, but if you ask them if they believe it, they don't. Half the time they don't believe it. They, they can tell you what everybody thinks, but what do you think? <laughs> I have no idea, they say. You know, Darwin thought this, my, my, my church minister said that, you know, he says this, my mom says that. What do you think? I have no idea, they say. They don't even want to guess. Anyway, interesting. Um, I am very uh, glad and, and uh, I'm happy for the, this data here that shows the success and the statistical significance of using commitments and the power of speech to improve behavior or, or to uh, increase self-regulation. Um, I, I'm also, on the flip side, sort of frightened by, you know, the amount of self-affirming negative uh, c uh, comments I hear students make and what that might mean for their psyche. And I'm wondering your thoughts about that for, you know, a, a teacher that hears on a semi-regular basis, like, I won't do it, or um, I can't do it, or, no, nah, that's for other kids. I'm, it's not for me. Um, you know, what, what studies have shown, what your recommendations are, what your thoughts are, you know, I'm just curious. Yeah. De defiance is, um, that's a, t a tricky. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I do think you shouldn't give orders that don't have a reasonable chance of being complied with, you know, that sort of thing. But I, I also think that sometimes the orders have to be given and if people are defiant, well I remember hearing, I think it was in your school, the, one of your, you or one of your teachers just said that, about a behavior, a t serious behavior problem, he said, that's not my problem, that's a police problem. You know, knowing this is as far as I take it. I, I'm, as a teacher, you're not a policeman. You know, if defiance is really aggressive, that's not your problem. That's some, some other agency is going to have to handle that. Within the domain of a classroom, teachers' powers are limited, but they, they do have, they certainly have the authority by virtue of being a teacher, and secondly, they have the authority given them by the fact that they're knowledgeable about the domains that they're talking about. So teachers shouldn't be ashamed to use their authority. There's a good article by Hannah Arendt, who's a very famous philosopher writing in the 60s, against progressivism she, uh, in education. She thought that progressivism, by being so child-centered and anything goes, the little darlings <laughs> can't do wrong, she thought that it had completely taken all content and structure out of knowledge. You know, the, the, Anything will, anything will go. If it's your own idea, then it's, it's your own idea. That's the end of the story. She said, no, it's not. The end of the story is, uh, ultimately comes down to authority. First of all, the authority of the knowledge itself. Is it valid knowledge? Has it been tested out? Do you know, is it serious thought? And secondly, the authority of the teacher as an agent of a society. And the, the society itself has agency and power. And all of those levels can't be ignored just by kids being um, defiant. But what you, I mean, they are, they often will say things like, no, I won't. And then what do you do? And you, well, you say, <laughs> what do you do? You, what did I do with my own kids? Well, there was a certain amount of <laughs> what would now be called abuse, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but no, not much, if any, of course, but a uh, certain kind of firmness, in, at least with the younger children, and then also consequences of the violation, and showing, well, here, how about, if, how about this? Negotiate a contract. You know, the kid said, I won't do that. Well, what would you agree to do? 
And so to put, put it back onto them and say, well, you know, I'd, and then sort of work out some compromise so they're willing to take it on. And then verbalize that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. There are rules. There are three simple rules to be in a serena where you breathe and think and sink, you breach, and you're promoted to yourself and others in the group. So I use those rules it, with students. I also use the rules of the rubric that everyone is accountable for, and like you said, making it very explicit. I also carry those things around in my head when I'm interacting with my own children and husbands, and I make them very explicit to them as well. So it's like, you know, we have to make, I don't use maybe the same language, but it's like, okay, we have to make sure we're in sync. Yeah. So that's rule number one of being serious. Oh, we have to make sure if we're not clear on something or we have something to say, we reach and we stop and we get our thoughts out. And then we also have to make sure we're being promoted to each other, we're pushing each other to do different things. So I just think making rules explicit, like you said, and then allowing the space for language, for people to say more, so that obligation is begin to form. Uh, Jane Allen Hunter did a study one time of classroom talk, and she found that teachers said, often said things like this, I hear talking. This was in the classrooms where it's supposed to be quiet. They'd say, I hear talking. And the virtue of that was, then it's not just the teacher saying, be quiet. The teacher's saying, there's rules here. There's rules here. And I'm just monitoring the rule, and it's being violated. So that way, you don't need to make it a personal authority thing. You can make it sort of, this is how the world works here. That, uh, I'm going to get a sentence. Yes, you should. I just want to um, note the time. I know some people have other things that they need to do, and we said we were going to end at 1230. So we're going to, we have the room, and you can stay here and informally talk, but anyone who has to be on their way, <laughs> the rule is that you may <laughs>